This Hagen conference has been will now be recorded. Ah, sorry. We're recording. Excellent. Yes. We're recording. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, first SIG strategy SIG call of 2020. Uh, Tricia and I are very happy to have you here. Today we have Megan Tongan, who's been a part of my team here at MIA for a few years. Um, she, all I can say really is that she's extraordinarily valuable and brilliant and wonderful. And I'm going to let her introduce herself and her topic uh, rather than me blathering on. Take it away, Meg. Great. Thank you, Douglas. And uh, thanks, Tricia, also for doing all the, the work and scheduling and organizing this and, and the great work you'll do on the, the strategy SIG this year. Um, thanks to everyone in the audience for bearing with the rescheduling. Um, my voice has finally returned from the flu, and I'm thankful and grateful to be with you all. Um, I appreciate you holding the time to have this discussion. Um, as I switch over to the slides, I'm going to turn my video off and please jump in on any uh, questions um, in the, the chat, but we'll, we'll hold time and have that opportunity at the end as well. Okay, so getting started, Agile leadership. Um, I'm really passionate about this topic. Uh, I have been at NIA for almost seven years, um, have risen up, through the, risen up through the ranks with Douglas's support and uh, really had lots of opportunities to try out new things. Um, one of those new things is Agile. So um, having this chance to uh, dig into what it means to practice Agile in a museum. Um, we've been doing that with our software development team for five plus years and really branched out um, to, to exercise that muscle with our cross-functional teams as well. So across the museum, thinking about how can we bring in this language and this practice. Um, and my role in particular, as a, a senior manager in media and technology, I, I work with all of our departments um, really closely. Uh, and then leading up digital strategy is thinking about how are we doing things holistically uh, in a way that makes sense across all of our products. Um, so for me in particular, that's that's having that product management role in Mia's website, the apps, and our, our CRM practice. I like to think about this as system thinking. Um, I love systems. Uh, my work really revolves around collaborative processes that deliver and sustain digital products, and I'm always looking for ways to improve that. So interested in how are we building our systems here that support teams and create space for creativity and learning and innovation. Um, that's really why I'm drawn to Agile, is that it provides a blueprint for that. And in this session in particular, just as a reminder, we'll be Exploring Agile leadership and how putting those values into practice promotes organizational models that are centered on people. That's the really critical piece here. It's about people, collaboration, and community. Um, so we'll dig into the theory a little bit and the Scrum process framework as a more specific um, logistical way to make this happen, uh, but also just review the basics and discuss this Agile mindset. I'm sure a lot of you on the call are very familiar with Agile, but if you're not, I'll, I'll get into some of the more um, basics as well. So <laughs> Agile, the landscape is complicated. Um, the subway map's a really great illustration of all of the things that you could dip into if you're, if you're practicing Agile. Um, but the core values are simple. Agile methodology is centered around the idea of iterative development, where requirements and solutions evolve through collaboration within self-organizing cross-functional teams. That's kind of my, my spiel. If we're talking about this internally, how can I um, help others understand why we're doing this, what the goal is? And there are many frameworks for this as, as shown here, but again, there's only four core values. So what are those values? Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working product over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. This is all from the manifesto for Agile Software Development, which is a hilarious website if you follow that link. Um, it's uh, from the 90s, which Agile is as well, and the site hasn't been updated, um, but I think that falls in line with Agile values that it delivers what it needs to just enough, just in time, and they'll leave it alone. Um, 
The founders of Agile really worked to create a set of these compatible values based on trust and respect for each other and to promote organizational models centered on people, collaboration, and building communities in which they and others wanted to work. Um, so the values focus on building culture, a culture that's supportive, sustainable, and a place for learning. It's about people working together to deliver something of value and welcoming change all along the way. And I just um, noticed that my images are not showing up, which isn't too critical, but um, I'll try to fix that if it becomes more of a problem. Um, so first off, there are some big concepts that carry across all Agile frameworks, and I find these next few illustrations from Michael Williams, a, a product manager who blogs pretty frequently, um, pretty helpful in explaining them succinctly. So first off, releases. Uh, it's better to deliver in small steps, incorporating user feedback along the way than to launch something big that takes a long time and ultimately is way off course. So I should also note here that my continuing education in Agile largely happens through Medium. Um, there are so many helpful resources from people actively engaged in this work. And if you're interested in the topic, uh, it's a great way to explore and their algorithm will quickly recognize what you're interested in reading. So um, I've had great success in finding resources there. Next on to iterative improvements. So again, smaller course corrections that allow for learning and continuous improvement. You might luck out taking big swings, but more often it burns out the team, it leads to misalignment, and it's, it's gonna take you longer to actually get the shot. And I don't gulp, so this is a poor analogy for me, but close enough. Um, just enough, just in time. So if you can be realistic about your backlog, that, that long list of things that needs to happen, and break out the work into smallest units that still provide value, then you'll be well positioned to respond to change and deliver something that actually means something to anyone. Um, rather than building these like epic Gantt charts, we should only add detail based on what we know right now. And when we know more, we can adjust, but it's better to go into our work plans with that expectation rather than be surprised when the scope changes because spoiler alert, <laughs> the scope will change. And so, as we think about those, those big concepts, these are the agile principles that really ground it. Customer satisfaction, welcoming change, delivering frequently. These um, have longer explanations to them that are really grounded in software development, um, but I think they can be pulled out and um, applied to basically any principle. Um, and so, again, in the manifesto, if you're interested in looking at those in more detail, um, and in my experience with Agile, it's really been critical to hold the values above all else. The, the language can get a little um, isolating. And if you're trying to bring it to um, a curatorial department, for instance, how do you do that in a way that's um, recognizing the audience and still bringing it back to the core values so that you can, you can make some movement on what you're trying to do? Um, so I think it's really about developing that mindset that's grounded in the principles more than following a prescribed framework. Agile is all about culture. It focuses on the values and the environment we share as much as the work we're doing. It's about how effectively we can work iteratively, we can inspect, adapt, reflect, and whether we put those mechanisms in place to continuously improve, both in what we're making, because ultimately you wanna make great things, but also how we're doing it so it's sustainable and that people want to work here. And so to that end, um, we've thought about defining Agile at MIA. Um, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, we hold Agile as one of our five workplace culture values. It's alongside mission-driven, generous, emotionally aware, and positive. Um, you can see on the slide how we've defined Agile, and I'm so grateful for this visible commitment to establishing an Agile mindset across our org. Uh, and having this tool that we can bring to meetings and bring to project planning um, to reference if we're struggling. So while a framework isn't everything, um, I think it's a really critical piece in, in the day-to-day. -day. How do we 
um, when digital transformation isn't about new systems or tools, it's all about people, behaviors, team dynamics, relationships, how do we do build the processes that actually center that? One way is an agile process framework. There are many. Uh, Scrum is one of them. We've been practicing it at MIA uh, for about five years. And um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction, not knowing the, the level of familiarity in the room, um, essentially we, we work through this cycle. And so there's a vision, the why. Uh, we have a product backlog, which is a not a prioritized list, but an ordered list, which is a really critical um, piece of language that I like to bring into to any of these conversations that you can only have one priority. And so when we have these um, dev teams at a museum who have uh, lots of competing interests, it's really valuable to think about what goes at the top of that list and who are the people that are competing for that rank um, and how can we bring them together to have a collaborative conversation about why this over this. Uh, so I think that product backlog is, is so key. Um, moving then into sprint planning, which is for the team, the, the, the product owner or the scrum master or the team. Those are the three roles. And as you jump into the vision, that's really the product owner's domain. Continuing on with the product backlog, that's the product owners. They're managing the why and the what. The moment it goes to the team, the team gets to decide how. And that's where we really consider this a self-organizing concept and that the team has that um, freedom and flexibility and autonomy to decide how they do their work and um, how they'll deliver it. And so um, moving through a scrum framework, it's essentially you have a sprint planning, you move into a sprint, it's usually one to four weeks, you have a daily stand up through that time, you deliver something, you have a sprint review so that you can say, okay, what did we deliver? Does that meet the spec? And we have a retrospective to reflect on the teamwork and how the actual process went. So we have the scrum master um, who can help facilitate that process, uh, working with all the stakeholders and working with the product owner, and just this really like team that has very clearly defined roles. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but I am a certified Scrum Master and a certified Scrum Product Owner, so I feel um, well versed in this framework. Um, but really, agile frameworks have a lot of similarities, and you can think about how do those values come back into this. Um, Scrum, I really want to iterate that or reinforce that it puts people before process or output because it focuses again on those values and the environment that we share as much as the work we're doing. We hold time for retrospectives because it's about how we're doing things and how we work together. And Scrum really comes down to these three pillars, transparency, inspection, adaptation. How are we practicing that um, so that we can build an environment for high performing teams? That's a team that's empowered, that's delivering, and that's continuously improving. Um, while we don't practice this to the letter at MIA, uh, it's definitely a way to uphold the Agile values in real life. That's, that's why to use Scrum or any Agile process framework. I think one of the interesting things about Scrum too is you won't see it referred to it, well you will, as a methodology. But in reality, Scrum is, it's like a philosophy or a, um, kind of an understanding about how you approach work. Uh, and I like to, to hold that when it stands up against project management in general. Um, there are countless Scrum resources out there, but this is really the only one you need. Um, it's a 16 page document. It outlines every aspect of the framework. The founders are very um, formal in that if you're doing anything outside of this document, then you're not actually doing Scrum. I think it's a little strict and there's definitely some easing up around that. Um, that can be done to evolve these things to our context. And Scrum is simple as uh, determined by that 16 page document, but it's not easy because it's all about people. And so how are we building an organization that takes that into account? Um, this visual really helps in that 
it's important to note that Scrum will not solve problems, but it simply exposes them. So Scrum brings that visibility to the workplace culture, both within your team and across the organization, because you're focusing on transparency. And the tools and processes, while powerful, aren't going to resolve those big issues unless there's really a culture shift. You need that to, to support the work. You can do Scrum, but you can't be agile without fully adopting the mindset. Um, and so as we move towards building these learning organizations, what does that mean? What, what needs to happen at uh, an organizational change level so that we can actually have a successful rollout of Agile? An extension of the Agile mindset is a product mindset. Projects have a start and end, but the digital products we deliver for museums generally don't. The website's never done. CRM platform is going to continue to evolve endlessly. With a growing portfolio of digital products, how do we build sustainability? How do we build that into our process to help us better prioritize and deliver on strategy? The first step is only building stuff that people need. Deliver value with every iteration and validate the need. The minimum viable product, which is a widely used and I think sometimes misunderstood um, term is a useful concept for questioning our assumptions. Rather than investing the time and money in building a car, can we first validate the need with a skateboard or a bike? Um, shared this with a developer recently and we were talking through, well, having the skateboard, maybe you determine that, no, I need to carry groceries. The bike's going to be necessary. Oh, it's raining. I'm going to need the car. So it's this um, conversation that we can have around what are your requirements and what might actually let you test that? So if we make things that users can actually use and test, we create that environment for learning that, again, welcomes change. Um, change isn't a bad thing. We're always excited about it. <laughs> and how can we use it to our advantage? So the, the MVP is really useful in that it validates the need, not the product. And the next time someone wants an app, how could we do the skateboard equivalent of that to help justify the need versus running with the product? Um, Agile planning circles is a format I came across recently and really the next step in acknowledging, uh, the next step in a product mindset is acknowledging that reality is not linear. Agile process frameworks can help us strike that balance between disorder and order and flexibility and structure between learning and performance. Um, but the agile planning circles really help illustrate how we can move through the cycles of strategic planning and delivery with a product mindset. So on one end, we've got the big stuff that's happening at a leadership level. And how do we put the right people and processes in place to actually deliver on that and not have to wait five years for that end vision to come to reality? Um, a product really can be anything. It could be a website, an app, it could be these digital things, but it also could be a public program or an exhibition. Product management takes this broad view, so it shifts the focus to our audience and the continued success of this thing that we're making, uh, not just our original scope. So we need strategic plans that allow us to respond to change. We also need to recognize that the product owner, or however we want to define that in our works, is a leadership role. The product owner sets the vision and makes decisions, or at least they should. They have the knowledge, availability, and authority to be a champion for the product and the users. It's a critical role that's really not well defined because it's probably living with middle management uh, and trying to figure out how do we grant them and recognize the authority that comes with that role and the ability to take decisions at that level. With that, I'd like to pivot to another leadership framework for a moment. Um, we know there's many brands of leadership, command and control, servant leadership, host leadership, uh, but I'd like to discuss how enabling leadership stands out in terms of agile. So this, um, I recently read this 2019 scholarly article, uh, Gisela Bachlander, was doing a piece on how Spotify 
and the Agile coaches at Spotify. And you can read a lot about Spotify and their Agile culture. It's pretty interesting. Um, but essentially, she was looking at how Agile coaches, which don't have a formal leadership role, um, how they are acting in this enabling leadership way. And it's about creating good conditions for accomplishing adaptive space. Uh, when I saw that, it just it immediately hit this as Agile. An Agile mindset prepares us for dealing with complexity. When we're facing that uncertainty and ambiguity and interdependence, we need leaders that pave the way for an adaptive space for learning, iteration, reflection. Um, Bachlander goes on to outline in complexity leadership theory that enabling leadership is, quote, creating structures and processes that effectively engage conflicting and connecting to trigger and amplify emergence into new adaptive order for the organization, end quote. That's a lot to unpack, so let's just pause for a second. Conflicting and connecting to amplify emergence. This is agile, conflicting and connecting. So thinking about how are we bringing conflict to the surface and doing it in an effective structured way, and how are we connecting people with users, connecting people to each other? How are we grounding all of this in connecting and conflicting? Furthermore, Bachlander defines the characteristics of enabling leadership. And this list could really be an effective blueprint for agile leaders who engage, empathize, and serve the team. These leaders are change agents embodying a set of characteristics that can create real organizational change. In another branch on this topic, I'd like to highlight an interesting connection between Agile and IDEA work. Um, when it comes to developing a learning organization where transparency and reflection is prioritized. I presented on this topic along with Nam Provost from MIA and Nikhil Trubidi from AIC at MCN in San Diego. So perhaps some of you are in the room, um, but we are starting to test out this model at MIA through our uh, strategic equity work group uh, and encouraged in a lot of the, the intersection here. It's definitely a work in progress, but something I'd like to just briefly introduce uh, if you're interested in exploring it further. So there are a few of the characteristics of white supremacy culture, and that's a big term to throw in at the end of a webinar um, if we're not going to spend time with it. But I will um, direct you to this resource, which was originally developed by diversity educators Kenneth Jones and Timo Kuhn. Um, you can also find an updated version of this work at dismantlingracism.org. Uh, it's a list of damaging characteristics that show up in our organizations as the default norms and standards, such as the ones I've listed on the screen, perfectionism, individualism, sense of urgency, power hoarding, fear of open conflict. These are all things that I'm sure we're very familiar with, uh, that we grapple with both on and personal individual level but also uh, at an organizational level and i'm really interested in how agile can be used in response to this um, there's really much more to say about it and i encourage you to look into the work and the resources available um, also through mass action at museumaction.org so some places to examine more specifically so the the white supremacy culture resource includes the antidotes to these characteristics, many of which really align with Agile values and practice, including several I've listed here. Um, so these are straight from her, um, Tima and Kenneth's document. Um, and it's fascinating how they overlap with the principles and the, the everyday work that goes into a process frame, framework for Agile. Um, so calling your attention to that, and I'll just kind of put a, a note in that. In summary, Agile is more than post-it notes and stand-ups. Really, Agile leadership is about building a solid foundation for an Agile practice by spending time with the values and the principles. If we're not getting that, that grounding in around values and principles, then the, the tools and the processes and the practices that we put in place, whether with 
it's within a team or across an entire organization will just not be as effective. Um, we need to find a framework that works for your team and to evolve for your context. Maybe it's Scrum or Kanban, Lean, something else entirely. It's all about finding the tools that help you live the values and adjusting those tools to help you live the values. Another thing I wanna remind is to get into a product mindset. Define who has the authority, knowledge, and availability for decision-making and don't undermine them. Let them run with it. Um, consider that enabling leadership in your management practice. I think there's lots of strong avenues that we can think about how are um, groups that don't have named authority, that are, are people like agile coaches, how do they um, embody uh, change? How do they bring themselves as a, a bearer of the culture? So really interested in that framework and how it connects with Agile. And then finally, uh, reflect on that intersection between Agile and how we can apply this mindset for organizational change across inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. With that, thank you. And I would love questions if anyone's interested. Before uh, we open up to questions, Megan, thank you. That was such a great comprehensive look into Agile and um, a great way to connect it to sort of larger issues of leadership and working with other teams. And I really liked the link to um, idea values at the end. So thank you so much. Um, but now, yeah, opening up to the rest, does anyone have any questions for Megan? Well, I have one to kick it off um, and others can hop in too, but I'm curious, Megan and, and Douglas, if you wanna hop in here too. I love the idea of agile values being in, in incorporated into your workplace values. I'd love to talk through or hear about sort of the process of getting that inserted on such a larger institutional level. And I'm curious too, our team for one has kind of a light agile approach. We use it mostly for digital projects, but in working with other teams have to be a bit more flexible um, and know that that kind of teaching and learning takes time. But I'd be curious, yeah, A, how that was inserted to your sort of larger values and, and mission of the organization and B, how you work with other teams in that framework. Sure. Um, Douglas, do you want to speak to the first round of when agility entered the conversation? Was that back in 2014, the first draft? Yeah, I think we were, um, as part of a strategic plan that kicked off in 2012, we were re-examining the entire business model of the museum. How do we um, how do we sort of flip the paradigm and become much more community anchored, community centered, uh, and focus our energies, our tone and voice, our brand, our the promise of who we are, the value we give to the community um, on the community. And as we examined that, there were a number of things that we did at the executive team level that, that of course, always involved working groups from, from the staff. One was to establish a written value proposition. What did this museum bring to this community that was unique and was um, valuable to that community? Uh, we also thought it would be really important for us to codify workplace culture we knew that we were evolving as, a, as an organization. We were um, regrowing staff numbers a little bit after the uh, real estate crash that had happened a few years before that. We wanted to think a little bit about how we would frame hiring and how we would frame talent strategy. So we started with a uh, consultation and we went through a long line of adjectives and other words. We built out some working groups of the staff uh, and we began to settle in on, on five or six sort of working adjectives as a way of defining our workplace culture. One that kept rising up was the word agility, which actually wasn't framed from agile development or agile engineering process. It was more framed in the idea that we would, um, through that agile lens, talk about how and when to pivot. So we would move away from an idea that we already knew what we were doing and it was just the stupid customers who didn't understand us into thinking about moving quickly with short steps, paying attention to the response, and then pivoting as necessary. 
clearly under Kaylin Feldman's leadership, that's something that we were committed to doing is something that she was learning about in her continuous learning. It was certainly a perspective that we brought from the digital strategy side. So it was one of our initial foundational principles. We have since now gone through a second iteration of workplace culture um, that is written and is shared with the entire staff. This time around, it was really owned by the staff instead of by the executive leadership team. But the words, in essence, didn't change very much. And agility, I think, has become inculcated in the organization now as just simply a way that we approach what we do. Megan, do you have things to add to that? Yeah, that, that work process. Um, so being owned by the staff, it was run by a group called Mia Mindset, which was a sub-working group of our equity team. Um, so it was really grounded in anyone who wanted to join was involved in this process. And then um, the leaders of that group organized these listening sessions over the course of several months where it was kind of a fascinating structure. It was every single word um, that was existing in our current values was examined on what does this mean to you? What does this bring up? How do you feel when you interface with it? Like just kind of this deep um, evaluation of how those words and the meaning and the current definitions felt, um, which took a long time, but it's one of those things that to put the actual input and buy-in of the entire staff was so critical in having it arrive at this place that everyone feels really great about. And so I think um, the central component was, as Douglas mentioned, keeping those, those core values. They didn't actually change very much but um, the definition of them changed. And so bringing an equity lens to all of it and recognizing how, what does Agile mean to us? What is the MIA mindset when it comes to Agile? And um, how do we want to share that with our colleagues? That's fantastic, Megan, let's talk I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. Megan, let's talk about a little bit, we've had this discussion at times about the difference between Agile with a capital A and Agile with a lowercase a and how we sort of conceptualize that here. Yeah, I mean, I think Agile with a capital A is, to my mind, what they do at software development companies. Um, it's the ability to, to do things by the letter um, because the organization was built around that principle. Um, Agile with the lowercase a, I think of more as the values. So how do we, how do we embed that mindset, but then give ourselves flexibility around the practice um, and recognizing that not everything applies in the same way and we can evolve it based on the project, like what's happening, um, what is the team structure like? I think there's so many things that can um, bring great flexibility to that and you don't lose out from it. Um, you, can, you can take bits and pieces and I think there's been lots of um, organizations, actually Spotify is one, that they like made their own brand of Agile and it's because it works for them and it's all about living into those values. And so as much as I can bring those back into the conversation, I think that's what um, helps us understand why this is important and why it's more than getting more stuff done in less time. Like that's not the, that's not the concept. Douglas, do you want to add to that? <laughs> We're having a dialogue now. Yeah. Um, I yes to everything you said, and um, you know, it, it is a fact that I think all of our organizations are. We're, we're all nonprofits. We're all um, scratching for funding. We we all, when we're doing big digital projects, if we don't have specified funding for that, it's sometimes tough to fit it into the budgets. And there's a kind of um, unwritten or unspoken idea about you know doing more with less sort of thing now that can either be extremely stressful and cause burnout and hurt your staff and result in really poor delivery or you can bring in these other kinds of perspectives and, and frameworks like agile like scrum where you're respecting people and you're respecting process in a different way and instead of um promising some kind of magical product um, that maybe some trustee or some director thinks is the, the magic bullet that will solve everything. What you're trying to talk about is that because we have, we have to run lean, we have limited bandwidth, we have limited resources, so what's the smartest way to run lean? Um, the smartest way to run lean is to work directly with your customer, um, 
do lots of little experiments, learn quickly, and keep moving, keep the momentum going. And there's also something about that, that iterative work that involves customers that um, creates this interesting psychology of shared ownership. People actually love to weigh in early. If you want to see people get really excited, go out into your lobby or galleries with some cardboard mock-ups of something and plop it on a table and give people post-its who have no idea what they're doing, um, but they love it. And then they start to feel like, well, when is it going to be ready? And when will I see the next version? How do I do this again? Like, it's a really interesting way to engage people in the, not just in the process, you're building things that they actually will care about and use in the future, but also feel as if they had a hand in making it which is a really interesting angle on, on customer engagement from our perspective. Hey, this is Donna when I have a question. Great, yeah, please. Hey, uh, Megan and Doug, thanks so much. Uh, great insight and presentation here, especially applied to um, the museum world here. Um, on that one slide you had with the Agile process framework, um, where it showed your product backlog and then the uh, the iterative cycle there. Um, does the museum there have a nice process for looking at the whole portfolio of products to decide which ones are, um, you know, you talked not about priority, but by order, right? Mm -hmm. And is that, do you apply that same uh, reasoning across different things like um, maybe a, a digital application versus a public um, or publicity campaign or something, or are they all separate? Or do you look at it as an entire portfolio that is gonna drain resources or use resources from across the organization? That's a great question. Um, we've struggled with it. So we have a developer, um, well, we have a development team of three. Uh, and the way that we used to handle the, basically like our, our sprint wall, our scrum wall, um, was to have swim lanes. And so we were really breaking that out into individual um, verticals. So this is for the website. This is for our digital storytelling app. This is something that CRM needs. Like we had these kind of divisions and we were managing multiple backlogs and it became so unruly and so obvious that we weren't prioritizing anything then. Um, we had too many things at the front of the stove. And so really the plan was to move to a single backlog and to have those hard conversations. What comes next? Um, it's been a kind of a game changer. So we moved from a, a physical wall, which we all really loved for a long time, um, into JIRA. So that, that, that visual of a single backlog is so clear and that the next five things are what we're gonna tackle and we're gonna plan the appropriate meetings and requirement gatherings around those as needed, um, but that we can't do it all <laughs> and that we need to be um, having those conversations in advance to help to help set the stage for that. So I think a single backlog is my advice. Hi, this is Linda Collette. I had a question. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you um, suggest implementing an agile leadership like project management strategy in the museum when the grants that they get are not designed that way? They're, they tend to be designed when you have, okay, take the next 30 months and do phase one, and then after that, date, phase two and phase three. So they're kind of beholden to these grant um, requirements, but they're not, just, they're not presented in an agile way to do the project that way. Absolutely. Um, we've definitely faced that. And I think grants are the most challenging um, to put this framework on top of because it does have that defined, it has defined uh, cost and it has defined time. And so we've sort of taken it out of that flexibility of saying, okay, so what can we, what can we adjust? We can adjust the features. And I've been really impressed that um, granting agencies are open to this. I think they're encouraged that you're using a methodology that will um, deliver value. So it's really about how you're talking about it in those grant applications that you can say, we can't predict the future. In three years from now, we're gonna deliver something that does this outcome rather than we will have this output. And so 
I think changing the conversation in that um, application process is really where you can make some some shifts and um, and help define the fact that we're going to deliver something. It's going to be great. It's going to make people happy. It's going like what are these like these bigger outcomes that we can talk about rather than I will deliver a website that has 18 modules and each of those modules will do X. Um, so I think giving the, the granting agency some credit that they might actually be really engaged in that and they might be even doing it sort of on, as their own process. Thank you. Hey, this is Don Irwin, Irwin with another question. Thanks, Don, um, yeah. Yeah, so lowercase agile across the institution, uppercase agile for specific projects. Do you, um, when you're looking at your portfolio of work, is this really applied to projects or, um, you know, there's the, you have your su support as well, your ongoing operations, um, you know, that are those, uh, this might be a resource management question really, but um, are your people who are just keeping the lights on, um, part of this process as well, or are they some of the people who are actually working on these projects? That's a great question. Um, so the place that we're doing this most comprehensively is with the software dev team. Um, so any, any work that flows into that team is managed in a way that allows us to structure it into a single backlog and to have um, you know, those ceremonies that go around it. Um, so that's our most to the letter. Uh, but then bringing in the concept of, hey, we should meet regularly um, on a cadence and, and talk about what's going well, what didn't go well, um, what would we change. Having that idea of a retrospective is definitely coming in in different areas. Um, you're probably referring to the IS team, the information system. So like, how is the help desk involved in this process? Um, to that end, we do have a, a board for them, but it's more of a Kanban approach. So to do, doing, and done, work is always going to be coming in. It's an ongoing effort. Um, it's harder to, to plan out those discrete moments when it's um, related to service. And so if it's a bug fix or it's going out and preparing um, someone's computer, those are things that are going to continue bubble up. And so I think Kanban is a better approach for that. Hey, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my last comment is, I want to work with you guys. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what sounds like the, um, what the main ingredient for success there is, um, it's, it's a culture, not a top-down directive, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's something that's really um, grown pretty organically, and things that are organic can be a little messy at times, too. So by no means do I, I come into this conversation saying we're doing this perfectly, we're not. Um, but I am really encouraged by the, the continued um, interest and growth that we have across departments um, in the, the general philosophy and how we can do our work differently together. So I think that's been the, the biggest outcome for me. And I think I would add to that, uh, you know, Megan and I often talk about how we're practicing agile meaning we're practicing like we're not we're not uh, mastering we're, we're working on it and a lot of my responsibility is at the executive level because that same perspective will often come back whether it's from the trustees or whether it's from a director or, or other executives like i want a deadline i want a budget i want to know everything that's going to happen a year and a half ahead of time i want a scorecard i want monthly goals in the scorecard so we in essence I sometimes will play that game or run that interference for the other teams. Like I'll make a scorecard, sure, whatever. I'll try to project what's out in the future. And then the scorecard gets really messy because I keep editing it. And then I have, that's an opportunity for me to train the other executives why that's happening. And that is happening not because we're um, bad at what we do or unmotivated or, or had bad ideas, but it's happening because we're getting direct feedback on whether this is working and therefore we're making a pivot that's strategically done in order to make sure that our projects are delivering the outcomes that we're aiming for 
not necessarily an output that we imagined two years ago in a strategic plan that now nobody wants. And to continue to have that role, I think, Megan, I don't know if I'm achieving enabling leadership, but I consider it one of my primary responsibilities to make sure that I'm, I am creating the conditions, right? So that I'm not, um, we joke too, that I'm, I'm like the PT boat that's intercepting the executive torpedoes. Because you, all of us know in our careers that you're working on this thing and it was approved and it was great and it's wonderful and you're, and you're getting there and then some executive comes along and just knocks the whole thing down. It's my job to take those shots so that the team doesn't, doesn't get hit with those things. Absolutely, thanks, Justin. You definitely do that. <laughs> um, one thing I want to add around the concept of, you know, I didn't get into all of the details of Scrum, but I think this is a valuable one. Um, not just the idea of adjusting our work plan based on customer feedback, but also having a sustainable work plan. Um, so all of us are stretched for bandwidth when it comes to museums. We run lean. Um, how do we do that in a planful way where we can actually predict when a grant application lands on our desk, whether we need to include external help? that this isn't gonna be possible to do within our team. And as much as we wanna wish that into existence, it's not gonna happen. And so I think um, having the tools with Scrum really helps you have some metrics around that. Um, you can do something uh, called velocity tracking. So essentially you start to put some numbers to your, to your items that you're accomplishing every sprint. Those numbers can give you a number of how much the team can do together in a given week based on whatever conditions were in place. So if the number is 40 and that's been pretty consistent across several weeks, somebody can come to you and say, I've got this big thing that needs to bump everything else off. Um, then you have some, some way to plan um, without, the, without making it so that the team um, isn't sustainable and that they're completely burned out. So I think that's a really critical part is that some of these processes and tools let you create the workplace that you want um, because it actually gives you the the talking points for um, addressing whether work is realistic or not. Any other comments or questions? It looks like we've got a few minutes left. I have to say thank you for sharing. Really appreciate your insight. Well, thank you. Um, it was a lot of fun to collect all of the resources and um, happy to talk offline as well. So if any questions come up afterwards or you'd like to, to follow up, I'd be happy to do that. Well, thanks so much, Megan. This was really, really insightful. And thank you all for joining. Thank you. Sure. All right, I'm going to stop recording, but I'll post it to our base camp and we'll talk to you guys soon. Great. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.